Hello, everyone. Welcome to Regrow's first quarterly policy briefing. My name is Eleni, and I'm the content marketing manager here at Regrow. And today we're joined by two experts in agriculture and climate policy, Jeff Seal and Lily Green, to discuss the most consequential pieces of legislation for Q1 2024 and how this legislation may affect emissions accounting, impact reporting, and compliance for Regrow customers. This is part of Regrow's new Policy Center, a series of insights developed by experts at and alongside Regrow in the field of land-based emissions and climate risk. A couple quick notes on this webinar before we get started. First and foremost, we would like to encourage everyone to ask questions about your business and to be open with other attendees about your goals and concerns when it comes to climate policy. We learn best when we learn together and from each other, and we can use Jeff and Lily's expertise best when we ask questions. Uh, feel free to drop those questions in the Q&A box, and we'll leave time to answer them at the end of the session. If we don't have time to get to your questions right away, we'll follow up with you individually after the webinar. Second, we'll be providing some key takeaways takeaways after the webinar with a high-level overview of the insights provided by our experts and an overview of some of the other recent notable policy changes in land-based sectors. So we know that there's been a lot going on in this industry and we want to make sure that you have access to uh, information about what we'll be talking about today, but also information about all of the other things that happened in land and ag-based climate policy this quarter. Uh, so watch your email for those updates. Okay, it's time to introduce our experts, Lily and Jeff. Lily Green is a vice president at Boundary Stone Partners, where she helps climate tech clients navigate the federal regulatory landscape. She has a JD from Georgetown and considers herself an admin law nerd at heart. So she is the perfect person to help us navigate these complex regulations. Jeff Seal is Regrow's director of environmental strategy and climate policy. Jeff holds a PhD from Texas Tech and has used his 25 plus years of experience to help develop innovations that improve the sustainability of agricultural systems. He's been awarded four US patents and is the author of 10 peer reviewed publications and two book chapters. Our takeaway documents for today will include an overview of the top five or six pieces of legislation we tracked this quarter. So in today's time with Lily and Jeff, we're doing a deep dive on Senate bills 253 and 261, along with the SEC's climate disclosure rule. There's a lot to unpack here, so let's get started. And Lily and Jeff, if you don't mind, I would love to start with a brief overview of each of these regulations first. Senate Bills 253 and 261. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Lenny. Um, so as Lenny said, I'm Lily Green, uh, Boundary or VP here at Boundary Sun Partners. And um, this is a really, really exciting time in climate disclosure. I know I just want to kind of state from the top that there are a lot of things that companies need to kind of be doing proactively, regardless of what's going to happen on the SEC federal level, um, because this is this is a moving train. Um, so regarding SB 253 and 261, so these are what the California, they're called the climate risk disclosure kind of regime coming out of California. So SB 253 requires companies doing more than $1 billion in annual revenue to disclose their scope one through three emissions um, and two CARB. Um, and reporting will be subject to forthcoming California Air Resources Board CARB um, regulations. And so this will, um, doing business is specifically outlined in California tax law. So if you are, um, a company doesn't necessarily need to be headquartered in California or organized for a commercial purpose in California. Rather, if you have transaction engagement, um, and there's also thresholds for sales of property, which we can go into uh, in depth if you guys want. And then there's also um, SB 261, which um, requires all companies doing business in California with more than 500 million in annual revenue in the state to report their climate related financial risks and measures that are using um, that are used to then report based on the task force of on climate related financial disclosures. So that's an acronym you guys are going to hear from me a lot, the TCFD, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, or an equivalent, uh, equivalent framework, and uh, it will be posted, that will be posted on the Franchise Tax Board's website. 
um, or another equivalent public website. So um, there's also another one I want to throw in there just because, and I know Eleni didn't mention this one, but it is relevant because it is a climate disclosure a piece of legislation that was recently passed, and that's the Voluntary Carbon Market Disclosure Act, um, AB 1305, which does require any company um, that makes that operates in California and makes claims of net zero carbon neutrality, significant emission reduction to track and report how they're measuring that progress, and then also disclose any usage of carbon, voluntary carbon offsets to meet those goals. Um, and important to note here, these are all pieces of legislation, so no regulations have been written by the specific agencies yet, whereas with the SEC, that is um, that is in the regulatory stage, which matters for litigation, which we will get to in a sec. So that's an overview of the three kind of big ones coming out of California, and so I'll pause there. Um, Jeff, Lenny, anything to add? No, I think you covered the details. Great. Should we move into SEC then? Let's let's do it. Um, so <laughs> I laugh because we've waited so long for this one. So they, the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission put out their draft regulations for these climate-related risk disclosures in March of 2022. So when these final rules came down the pike um, earlier this year, they were hotly anticipated, and a lot of that anticipation stemmed from the SEC's inclusion of a requirement for certain types of companies uh, to disclose their scope three emissions. This kind of caused a firestorm, partially why it took, we think, two years you know, to get these final rules. Um, but what the SEC rules do now, they are um, paired back, and I want to kind of just not caution everybody, but it is really important to view these SEC rules specifically through a reasonable investor standard lens. So the SEC only has jurisdiction to regulate financial information that would be pertinent to a reasonable investor. So that's consistent, comparable, and decision useful information. Um, and what the SEC has done here is, again, they use the TCFD, those ta that Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, but they do not wholly incorporate it, and that's for legal and policy issues. So what is left of the kind of the original rule is you still, companies um, that are public and file uh, their annual financial disclosures with the SEC will have to disclose material cl climate-related risks, and materiality is that standard um, that reasonable investor standard, right? What would a reasonable investor want to know about your business? And is that material to your financial bottom line? So they're going to want to know material climate related risks, risk management and governance, right? How you as a company are overseeing the potential risks. You, There are certain companies um, that will need to disclose greenhouse gas emissions, both scope one and scope two, noticeably absent, scope three. Um, but there, and that is for large accelerated filers and accelerated filers. So these are the biggest publicly traded companies that the SEC has determined have the internal reporting infrastructure and the ability to start this type of reporting, granted with limited, limited assurance, uh, and then moving to reasonable assurance after a specific transition period. Other things companies will have to disclose is the financial impact of climate related issues, right? So this is a huge one for any sort of land-based operation sector. So this is potential financial impacts of severe weather, other natural conditions, changing baselines, right? And then the expenses that you have incurred and the capitalization costs due to those expenses, right? So that is going to be a huge category um, for land-based um, agribusiness moving forward. If you set any climate related targets or goals, they're going to expect you to report on that. And this is kind of a where some of the perverse incentive comes from, because people say, well, we're not going to make climate related commitments anymore if we have to disclose and report on them. So that'll be an interesting one to watch. And then any use of carbon related uh, or carbon offsets or renewable energy certificates um, and then disclosure around both transitional risk uh, and, of course, physical risk. Um, so I'm happy to go into, they are currently, the SEC um, currently voluntarily stayed these rules, so they are not presently going into action, but there are timelines which will likely be pushed back, which we'll get to when we get to the litigation portion of this discussion. 
Awesome. Thanks so much for the overview. Uh, Jeff, anything to add to that one? Um, just to build on what Lily said at the beginning about, okay, these things are now coming out and this is the beginning. <laughs> They're just going to be more and more. And I think um, the reaction we've seen so far is more of one of, oh, this is a problem. <laughs> this This is very difficult and we should fight against this. And I think the companies that have the foresight to think of this as an opportunity instead of a problem are the ones that will get ahead. And we already see that um, with companies, um, particularly in Europe, because Europe is a little farther ahead with the CSRD. And um, we just had a call this morning with some folks, and it's clear that there are a few leading companies there who have chosen to get ahead and to start now, even though they're not required for another year, 18 months. And so I think those are the companies that in the end will benefit from the rules because they get ahead and they get practices in place. And I think two other things, one is the, the obvious one is you will be judged by potential investors, right? And so that's, you know, a big deal, right? It's like how you respond to this will be viewed um, by that investment community. And then the other is it will also be viewed by the public, right? And so when you think about risk mitigation, there's the reputational risk um, that also plays into this when you think about um, what your company is doing in, in the space of the current climate crisis. So I think those are things to keep in mind as you think about you know, the things that we're going to talk about as far as going down this pathway of disclosure and reporting. Yep. And Jeff, I'm so happy you brought those up because the idea of, you know, when people think climate risk disclosures, they think the big, you know, like scope, like emissions, right? Whereas what you're talking about is very much so kind of the soft power, the transitional risk, that reputational harm, which both the SEC and California um, SB 261 require you to disclose, right? And so getting ahead of that and kind of understanding where all of these potential landmines could be if you don't have a specific plan in place, I think that's a really good framing to have. That's a great framing to have. Uh, in one of our earlier conversations, I remember talking about transitional risk and realizing the weight of that, um, especially when when put next to these sort of physical risks. Um, another thing that I would like to jump in and ask, and you've you've both answered this lightly at some point in your overview of um, the SEC climate disclosure rule, but just to be super crystal clear about it. Some of our customers and partners have asked that, you know, if scope three emissions are omitted from um, this rule, does that mean that we no longer have to disclose them, even though in land based uh, industries and companies, they are material to uh, our operations. And one thing, Lily, that you mentioned that I think is a really powerful consideration is that scope three emissions are quite important for, for land-based industries and companies because those scope three emissions will, are also the spaces that will be impacted by changing climate. So crop yield, commodity prices, so on and so forth. And Jeff, you mentioned something to that effect as well. Um, so I just want to want to get your take on whether that is material, if it's something that land-based industries and companies should be considering, even though it's not technically in regulation. Jeff, do you want me to take a stab at this one first? Okay, <laughs> happily. So, um, and I also, first, I want to echo what Jeff said and bring up yet another acronym, but really important to remember here is the global context in which a lot of these, both agribusinesses and land-based um, companies are operating, right? So we have, um, the SEC rule, right, which of course, as you said, Alani, and we all kind of know at this point, does not include scope three. We have California, um, which SB 253 does include scope three. And between SB 253 and 251, it's estimated that around 10,000 companies will be within the scope of that mandate. Um, additionally, you have an a international wrinkle here with the EU Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Um, and so that is set to take effect 
um, and it phases in. It's a taking effect now, but it phases in over the next five years and will likely start to apply to an estimated 3,000 U.S. companies. So when we think about, I kind of think them think about it in, you know, three a three circle Venn diagram. We have the EU CSRD, you have the suite of California laws, and then you have the SEC rule. Well, there's going to be a lot of companies that, yes, are just would just be covered by SEC, but you're going to have potentially even more that are either covered by CSRD and California or both, right? So if you are not covered now, explicitly there is a good chance you could be in the future. Or to your point about materiality, Eleni, you will be part of somebody's supply chain that is going to need that data, right? And this is why, um, so in the lawsuit filed against the California regs or the California laws, my, excuse me there, that you have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and then you have the Farm Bureau as well because there's a lot of concern around how farmers are going to be able to participate in the measurement of scope on farms emissions that could potentially contribute either upstream or downstream, right? So we'll go through um, kind of our recommendations at the end of this, but I think it's really key, even if you are not explicitly under the jurisdiction of the SEC right now to treat your, your own scope one emissions, as or your own, yeah, your own scope three is somebody else's scope one because they will come looking for them. Jeff, anything to add there? Just in general, um, thinking about it's not mandatory, but depending on where you report, um, you may be required to report to the reporting agency, right? So if you're reporting to ISSB, um, the International Sustainability Standards Body, right? They're requiring scope three as part of that reporting. Um, and then when you think about guidance that's coming out, the SBTI flag guidance on the land emissions, right? So there are going to be new um, guidance on target setting there for the land sector. And then, of course, we're all waiting with bated breath for the final release of the land sector removals guidance from the greenhouse gas protocol, which will all provide guidance on how these reporting things happen. So it's clear even... I mean, from the regulatory and the legal side, but then there's also on the voluntary side, you know, over the last few years, there's been like a substantial amount of effort to figure out exactly how we're going to do these things. So, um, you know, it's, I, I think there's, we're not going to put the, the horse back in the barn, so to speak, it's coming. And so um, I think all of these things converging together to make this um, something that, uh, you know, we need to to go ahead and, and get ahead of and, and start to figure out how we're going to to solve this. Yeah, that's that's great insight. Thank you. And I like what you have both been saying, which is, uh, well, you've been saying this in a couple different ways, but but you've said that maybe there is conflict in how these laws or regulations are coming to life, or maybe they're coming to life in different timelines, but the, the wave is pushing towards sort of this common, this more common theme. Um, Lily, I like what you said about how, you know, your scope three is somebody else's scope one and vice versa. And Jeff, I really like what you said too, about how you know, you can't, you can't put the horse back in the barn necessarily. It's important to be preparing for, you know, even if the, even if regulations or laws don't affect your company now in this first wave, it's something that the, the industry is trending towards. So I wanted to dig into that a little bit deeper and ask maybe how these laws and regulations are in conflict with one another, maybe from a legal standpoint, which we've also discussed, but more importantly, in practice, what does that look like for farmers or for companies that are trying to figure out what to do with all this information? So I'll lead off from a, from a legal standpoint. Um, it is unlikely that these laws will be in direct conflict with each other um, by virtue of when they're going to go into, when they're going to go into effect, the stay we have for the SEC, and then kind of these both California and the SEC have grown out of the same framework, right? With the TCFD. So your the whole idea here, and this pervades even national and goes to the international standpoint, the initial worry many years ago was that 
if you do this in a piecemeal isolated jurisdiction sense, no one is going to, everyone's going to be reporting different things on different metrics and different timelines and all of that. So there has been a concerted effort, and that was kind of the initial idea behind the TCFD and ISSB also integrates all a lot of the same information, right? Um, so legally, if, you know, it's not to say if you comply with California or comply with ICC because there's so many different filings, all of that, but there aren't any general conflicts yet. That being said, CARB um, has yet to raise regulations, right, around SB 253. So you could see some there. Um, so that's that's the legal the legal side. I the other part of the question, if you could rephrase, and maybe Jeff can dig in there. Yeah, Jeff, I would love to know how how these might come into conflict with one another in practice, or even how uh, these laws and regulations may be difficult to adhere to in practice. Maybe not so much that they're in conflict with one another, but what obstacles may people face? Yeah, again, I think. To sort of build off what Lily said, um, I don't think there'll be conflict um, when I, so for me, I think the issues come down to the data and how how you collect the data, um, what level of data you collect. And so in that sense, I think the greenhouse gas protocol land sector removals guidance will sort of um, guide that direction because most of the rest of the reporting and accounting guidance sort of flows from that. Um, and SBTI and others um, that um, have guidance in the space has said publicly they will make sure their guidance is consistent with the land sector removals guidance when it comes out. So I think there's probably less opportunity for conflict when it comes to that. But to your question, I think the real question is like, what are the difficulties going to be? Um, and that clearly is going to be the level of data, you know? So when you think, um, particularly in the land sector, if you're a food company that sources from tens of millions of acres, right? All 10 million, tens of millions of acres of those emissions, somehow you have to have those data and collect those data. And I think that's where everybody sort of freaks out whenever these things come out. It's like, oh my gosh, how am I ever gonna be able to collect that level of data? I sort of suspect maybe that's the intention, but when the reality comes to have to collect all of that data, I think practicality will sort of win the day. And so while maybe I can't get um, data on those tens of millions of acres, we do have tools and the ability to collect data at a level that can give some reasonable and credible estimate of what those emissions are. Um, and so I think as this often happens, we will start off with a really high bar that's like, oh, we have to do this. And then when it comes down to actually doing the work, we find that, um, you know, we can't quite get to that level, but we we find ways to get to the level um, that we need to make these things workable, right? Because in the end, if they're not workable, then it doesn't really help us to solve the problem. So I think, you know, building the tools and the data sets um, that, that give us that level of reasonable credibility and reasonable assurance that we're making progress is the real goal here. Couldn't agree more, Jeff. And I just, I, this idea of starting early when you're not mandated to do this is going to be a cost savings in the long term and like understanding intentional and intentionally going into the data that you have, the data sets, your, your, you know, internal infrastructure for managing data and saying, what do we have, where are we now and where do we need to get to, to then kind of set that path for yourself on your own time and on your own budget, as opposed to saying, oh, well, we need to start complying by Jan 1 of next year. We got to pay a premium for these service providers to come in, work overtime to overhaul. So I think a lot of this to me is a financial takeaway as well, in addition to any sort of reputational, other, other transitional risk of the more time you have, the better processes that you can put into place for yourself on your own timeline. Yeah, I think uh, those those insights are are really helpful um, to know first that 
it's not a complete mystery. Compliance is not a complete mystery. The tools and the technology and the data exists at a level that is workable. Um, but it is about building the right processes, giving yourself the, the luxury of time to set yourself up so that when these do become immediate for your company and it's, you know, we're, we're talking in timelines that to me feel sooner rather than later. So um, it's not like, you know, you've got decades to, to build these processes, but when these do become immediate for your company, you have the resources in place and you know the direction you're heading. So you can say like, here are the resources we need to bring into this. We can finalize these pieces. We don't have to start from scratch and we have access to the data we need to make change quickly. So well said. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would like to dig into navigating these regulations um, just a little bit more uh, from your own experience and expertise. So Lily, I might pose the question, if you were legal counsel for a CPG company or a company that was soon going to fall under these regulations, what would you suggest or what resources would you suggest they build? Um, and then Jeff, I'll have a, a parallel question for you as well. Absolutely. So I have a, I have a short list and a long list, um, but I'll lead off with my short list. Um, so first and foremost, I think you need, companies would do very, very well to conduct, to first familiarize themselves with whatever law um, and or regulations that they would be coming under the jurisdiction of, right? Whether that's SB 253 to 61, potentially SEC, but at the very least, even if you have questions around your, um, the, the, whatever mandate you fall within, familiarize yourself with the TCSP recommendations, right? There, it's not that long, I say, it's like 79 pages, <laughs> that's not long to me. Um, and, um, we can be sure that that link gets included in the materials we send after because so many of these regulations and um, legal frameworks are going to be based off of those. And then that the second step in that process then is to do an internal audit of your current capabilities as they relate to the information identified as necessary within the TCFD, right? So understand in a general sense what you are going to have to report and then figure out what information you have, what information you're going to need, and then start building that internal climate data infrastructure to get you the information that you need in the timeline in which you need to report it. Um, and I will say just the four overall kind of core elements, right? I know I keep mentioning it. I know I keep mentioning TCFD. It's really four inner locking circles here. So first is governance, right? How are you support, how does your organization's management structure identify and respond to climate related risks and opportunities? The second is strategy, right? The actual and potential impacts of these climate related risks and how they impact your organization's bottom line and financial planning. Third is very related and that's risk management, right? How are you identifying, assessing and managing your climate related risks now? And more importantly, in the future based on the information that we know from climate data modeling and that type of thing. And then finally is the more nuanced, which I think people immediately zoom into, which they should start at governance then go strategy risk management, are the metrics and targets, right? Because if you're just going straight to the metrics and targets, if you don't know how these metrics and targets relate to your strategy or to what risks you identified, you're kind of just gonna be diving down and missing the forest for the trees, right? So those are my two recommendations. Uh, that was my short list, if you can believe it or not. Um, so familiarize yourself with TCFD and then really do that next step for yourself, understand what information you have, what information you need and how long it's going to take to get that information. Very helpful. Um, Jeff, do you have anything to add to Lily's comment um, first? And second, given your experience, is there anything you would add to that consideration set when it comes to uh, the data or science behind um, measuring and monitoring emissions or uh, relationships that you would want to build with partners up and down the supply chain or in your own network to help accelerate 
a company towards that change, but not in a silo, um, in a way that's collaborative and comprehensive. Yeah, I think the one thing that I would add, to, or the maybe a detail that I would add to to Lily's uh, short list, um, maybe it's on her long list. Um, build that relationship with the auditor that audits your corporate sustainability report because they are going to be very much in touch with the details of what needs to be in these disclosures. Um, and so I think a lot of times that sort of external third party auditor may not necessarily be seen as a resource like on the front end of the process. It's more of a, a gatekeeper on the back end. So I think that's that's a resource that I think I would definitely um, tap into. And then I think more on the sort of science and accounting side, I think, um, you know, groups like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, if you're a member of that group, I think there's a lot of resources, um, knowledge sharing within those partners um, to, to help uh, navigate uh, some of these processes from a sort of just an accounting and a science perspective. Um, the Value Change Initiative um, is probably the leader in the Scope 3 accounting space. So, again, more of the process and the, the guidance on uh, on how to do this in a way that's um, credible. Um, and then just, you know, the colleagues you have within your company and your network. I mean, we're all dealing with this and we're all dealing in different ways um, and have different perspectives. And so I think bringing sort of that collective knowledge together can help um, identify the right path, but also like make you feel like you're not fighting this thing alone, right? It's like the more, there's more power in numbers and, and the more you can build up those sort of networks of folks to, to share, I think it becomes sort of less daunting of a task. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, really good takeaway lists for people to use if they're wondering where to go next or how to start preparing for upcoming and existing laws and regulations. Um, I wonder if we might go back to one concept that uh, we spoke about earlier in this conversation that we could dive into a little bit more, and that's this idea of transitional risks. Uh, there seems to be a lot of knowledge and a lot of knowledge sharing around how to communicate the uh, straightforward uh, business-related financial risks uh, of climate change um, or uh, of climate change. But um, I wonder if there is a way to word or to quantify or to put some more boundaries around those transitional risks so that companies can use those to bolster a business case for investment or to further highlight the importance of this work. And to make my question maybe a little bit clearer, if you could bullet point some transitional risks uh, that uh, maybe uh, experts could highlight to their businesses to get more buy-in from other business units. Absolutely. So I'm happy to lead off, lead off with the one that I always like to use especially in this context of kind of first mover, will they, won't they, when looking at a federal role versus state versus international. So one of the concepts um, in transitional risk is jurisdictional risk, right? And it all like jurisdictional plus supply chain risk. So the idea here, right, is, is there any risk that you will be regulated, not necessarily by the federal government, but by other governments moving forward? And how will that impact like you, your supply chain, and your ability to operate in those markets moving forward, right? And so that is a, a big foundation of you know, why I think the CSRD is so important, because it will apply to 3,000 US-based companies, right? And looking forward to the types of regulations that are in place in the EU, that's going to, if you're not in compliance with that because you don't think the U.S. standards are going to move anywhere at a federal level, 
you're going to lose the market opportunity to work with who you want to in the EU from a supply chain perspective, right? And that market will be foreclosed to you if you're not in compliance with those standards that they're putting in. So that's like the regulatory jurisdictional risk is a huge transitional risk because, right, it's not physical, but it's those governments within the climate transition making their own decisions and impacting your business moving forward. Yeah, and I think... <clears throat> I mean, related to that from sort of the data perspective builds up to the supply chain issues, right? If you're not willing to collect those data that you need, like as Lily mentioned very early on, right? You're in a highly interconnected supply chain and like your supply chain partners may be, you know, required to do that. And if they, if you can't collect the data and you can't get what you need to supply them, then again, that creates um, a loss of opportunity for you, right? Because they will go somewhere, <laughs> they will find someone who will be willing to provide the data. And so I think on the data, on the data side and the science side, if you can't provide that in sort of your interconnected supply chain, then that's, that's a huge risk. And kind of part and parcel to this less so, well, there's the business um, reputational risk, but then there's also just the general reputational risk with customers and with your, you know, um, hiring pool. There's this considered considerable, um, you know, data around what type of employers that this next generation want to work for, right? And not having these types of, or not being a vanguard or a leader in these types of transparent data climate practices could put you at a reputational risk for your customers not wanting to buy from you, for people not wanting to work from you, right? And so all of that, again, feeds into the idea of a bottom line that is being impacted by these kind of soft power type reputational risks. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's it's an important thing for companies to add into their strategies um, is this consideration for transitional risks the same way that you would um, build and refine business strategy around any topic. It's considering the the full aperture lens rather than zeroing in on what we will be required to do or what is immediately or physically pertinent to our business uh, from a risk standpoint. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I think now would be a great time to dive into some questions. Um, we've talked about a few things already that I think are, are really important for listeners to take away when it come to take away uh, from this conversation, especially when it comes to SEC's climate disclosure rule and Senate bills 253 and 261. We talked uh, about transi transitional versus physical risks and what climate risk actually means. We talked about what this legislation and these regulations imply in terms of the future of the industry. This is coming down the pipeline. It's best to prepare for it in a way that you have control over your time and your resources. Um, and finally, we talked about some ways that you can start uh, building a path forward and start looking ahead to what's coming down the pipeline in terms of understanding what you have available, understanding how long it's going to take you to get to a place where you can feel comfortable reporting on emissions in these ways. Um, so we've talked about all of those, uh, which are great. And we also talked a little bit about implementation, but we got a question that is a, a great way to zoom in on implementation. And that question is, what specific challenges do you see ag and food companies around reporting scope three emissions? If you had a magic wand to do whatever you want, what solutions would you implement to solve those challenges? So I think this is probably the key question when it comes to the ag and food sector is like, how am I going to collect the data, right? I think the data is the biggest challenge, you know, like like I mentioned in, at the beginning, right? If you're if you're an ag input company that sells inputs and, in, you know, to 180 million acres just in the U.S., that's a lot of data, right? So I think if I could wave a magic wand and solve that problem, it would be to build out a system that sort of could use... Um, you know, technology like remote sensing or other other technologies that can collect reasonable estimates of those data, 
with minimal input from the farmers, right? So we don't need farmers to be spending all of their time working in spreadsheets and pulling in receipts and everything else. We need, their time needs to be spent farming, right? And so that would be my magic wand was create a, you know, a system, a highly connected system so that like data can, can be um, propagated where it needs to be, when it needs to be in as seamless a manner as possible. Yeah, I think that makes so much sense. The interconnectedness of the system um, means that everything needs to be as streamlined and as smooth as possible so that people can focus on the work they do best in the farmer's case, being good stewards of the land and um, across the supply chain, making sure that you're getting the right information from all your partners to ensure that that holistic chain is as uh, sustainable, regenerative, insert climate goal here as it can be. Um, great. Uh, another question that we've uh, received is if, Lily, if you could dig into the reasonable investor standard lens a little bit more, uh, is this something we can apply to all our efforts when it comes to policy compliance? And if you could explain it once more and uh, explain whether there exists a framework on what that means, or if this is something that, um, that you're offering as just a a way of thought moving forward? Um, so it is very much so a uh, defined in the body of SEC law. Um, and so this is a, a um, judicial case law, right? And so through various, it's not just specific to climate related disclosure, it's very much specific to the type of information that the SEC itself as a administrative body has the legal jurisdiction to require companies to release. And so um, it is, I'm happy to go into just like a little bit of kind of a, as an admin law nerd. Um, so it is a, it's a legal test essentially used in securities law to determine it's the materi materiality of the information that a reasonable investor would want to know before making an investment decision, right? And so under this standard, the question is not whether a particular investor, right? So whether an ESG, very forward thinking, patient capital investor would wanna know these things, but it's a reasonable investor, right? Um, but So whether a hypothetical investor would want to know the information to make an investment decision, um, in the company, essentially, right? Um, and the standard exists as a way to make sure that there is a, I wanna say like a consistent and objective way to make sure companies are disclosing materially relevant information. That's both a balance of not overburdensome, right? But not the absolute bare minimum where things that people, if they knew, would have made a different decision, right? So um, it's typically applied in three different contexts, only one of which is re uh, relevant here, right? So uh, securities fraud, everyone's favorite topic. <laughs> um, then uh, private litigation, right? Um, so if you are a private investor um, and you invest in a company and you say, oh, well, I found out material information after I invested in this company and it, if I had it beforehand, I would not have invested in this company, right? And then, of course, regulatory disclosures, right? To determine what information companies must disclose under securities regulations like the climate-related um, risk disclosures. So that's, it's a very hefty body of case law. It's not defined anywhere. It is judicial in creation, and it is applied across securities uh, regulation and disclosure. So I know that's a very legal, non-climate-related um, answer, and I'm happy to go further in depth into anything there as it relates to climate-related disclosures. <laughs> 
Thank you. Yeah, I think um, I think the fact that it's a legal body is important to know, um, and also it's important it's important for sustainability teams or for compliance teams to know that there exists and uh, a middle ground, and that that sort of middle ground, reasonable amount of information, is favored in this light. So if you know, there, there is a world in which compliance teams will need to understand what that means. Um, but in general, it's also important to know in the grand scheme of things where these regulations aren't requiring and asking for things that are beyond what's reasonable, um, but also they won't settle for something below what's reasonable either. What is going to be required has been defined and has been defined in a way that can carry the industry forward reasonably and uh, won't allow for skirting of the rules, so to speak. Yeah. And one thing I'll also say on that, right? Like this is the reasonable investor standard is exclusive to the SEC. Um, and a lot of the litigation you will see, and that has already been filed, is saying that the SEC this this type of information is not only not material, but it's actually uh, unconstitutional under the First Amendment because it's considered compelled government speech. So I want to be very, very clear that no other body, California, EU, anything like that, has this reasonable investor materiality stand for, uh, standard. It's just the SEC. And because it applies to all forms of securities regulation, not just this climate-related um, risk disclosure rule. If you are already, if you are a publicly traded company that already has to disclose to the SEC, your team should know what this means, right? <laughs> to Jeff's point, um, to be very friendly with your auditors, with your financial team, like they know what a reasonable investor standard is. They know what is material. These are things that companies have been reporting on for years under and decades under these standards. It's just now that it's the first time that something that things related to climate and climate change are being considered material. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, going back to data, uh, and perhaps both of you would have an input on this question. When we're talking about data, would you emphasize baseline emissions data or data on reduction claims or both uh, when it comes to field level data? So I think in terms of what's required for the disclosure, right? I think it's sort of that baseline um, baseline emissions data, right? Do you need to report what those what those emissions are? Um, but I sort of look at that as like, oh, that's just a minimum requirement, right? It's like it, as you think about like your progress on this path, it, that's the place you have to start, right? I have to know where I'm at before I can do anything about it. And so I think that's sort of like where you start. And then I think follows from that, okay, now how am I going to like mitigate that? You know, it's like, this is the risk, this much emissions. Um, now, what is my, what is my um, solution, right? So how do I build out? What am I going to do about this? My mitigation solution. Um, which then requires you to start to like measure those reductions as you implement those um, interventions along the supply chain, right? So to me, to me, it's a yes and, um, and you start with where you're at, and then you figure out where you need to get. If you're if you're a science based target, then you already sort of know where you have to get, right? Because you've set an SBTI um, target. So now it's just a question of um, you know building out that pathway to get there. And I've said it better myself. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, with so much changing, what are some ways sustainability teams can keep up with all of this? What sources do you use and trust? And do you have any suggestions on how to disseminate this knowledge internally with teams? I mean, I think I'll go back to the same groups that I mentioned earlier, right? So if you're, you know, participating in the World Business Council, um, those types of industry groups that um, have a focus on sustainability, I think those are are, are great places. And then, um, you know, follow the groups that are building out the guidance. So the Value Change Initiative, Vera, because they put out, you know, gold standard, um, the, the greenhouse gas protocol, those, those groups are all very good um, about, putting out 
um, regular newsletters that have the latest developments. Um, so those are, are really great places. Um, and then um, sort of just on the sort of legislative front, um, there are many groups that create legislative trackers. Um, and I think sort of in this sort of carbon space and particularly in the ag sector and carbon removals, I think the Carbon 180 team um, builds out a very fantastic legislative tracker that um, can help you stay ahead of uh, developments that come out, um, particularly things related to the farm bill, when I think about things that are relevant to, to our discussion today. So those are sort of the places where I go to make sure that I stay on top of things. Yeah, my number one uh, recommendation, especially for ag side carbon related practices is Carbon 180. They have a weekly newsletter that's really fantastic. Um, and they cover kind of developments writ large in the space in addition to um, the ag and land use sectors as well. Um, otherwise, um, this is just so, you know, DC uh, <laughs> climate consultant here, but Cal uh, Politico has a California specific newsletter that is really actually phenomenal. It's short, it's brief. Um, and then Axios has a daily um, climate change and energy related newsletter as well. That's more so for the federal side, right? Obviously Politico California is for, um, and it's specific to climate developments, right? So it's not like you're getting the whole California legislative digest or anything like that, but those two and then carbon 180 um, are really, really solid. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I've got a couple a couple more questions sort of to, to carry us through to the end, though, if anybody has any additional questions, we still have a few more minutes, so feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, but the, the first question is, what makes you most excited about this legislation, these regulations, and what makes you nervous about it as an advocate for sustainability and climate progress? Um, well, I'm happy to go first. Um, I'll start with bad news first. <laughs> I am the thing I think I'm most anxious about, and this kind of applies to climate leg legislation and regulation at large, is the absolute entrenched interests that just don't want to see this happen at all. Um, and so they're going to use the huge amount of political influence and capital that they have to slow this down in court. Um, it can take a long time and we don't really have a long time, right? These implementation timelines, as you mentioned, Eleni are, they're not long, right? It's 20, 2025, 26, 27. And then when you start thinking past that, it's like, we are at 2030 at that point where so many of these goals and climate objectives end, right? We want to be here by 2030. So that being said, like my fear is that powers that be are going to slow this down politically and legally. I think the train has already left the station. And the people, the momentum of this climate disclosure train by virtue of not just top-down regulation and laws, but companies like Regrow who have responded to a market need are already pushing forward the, the data collection piece the, you know, the interconnectedness of this all, those things are happening with or without this regulation. And now with the regulations that will stick, will just continue to spur that on from a mandatory perspective. So I'm really, um, I'm not a techno optimist by any perspective, but I just think the private sector innovation in this space that has exclusively been responsive to a market dynamic, not a mandatory regulation, is one of the things that I'm most excited about. Yeah, those are really good. Um, now I have to come up with my own. <laughs> um, it, it very much reminds me of my favorite podcast in this space, the Outrage and Optimism podcast, like what makes you outraged, what makes you optimistic. Um, I guess I'll start with the optimistic piece. Um, I'm glad that like we're finally going to put a stake in the ground and say you have to do this. You know, I mean, I'm a little disappointed that the SEC caved on the scope three piece, but the fact that others haven't caved on the scope three piece makes me optimistic. That's like, okay, good. We are actually going to have to disclose this scope three problem. Um, so I, like that makes me optimistic that in spite of all of the stuff that Lily said, um, you know, that yes, we've recognized that we first have to disclose before we can do anything about it. 
Um, what outrages me is how companies are slow to like take this up. So instead of using the energy to like figure out, okay, hey, what is this opportunity and how am I going to do this? It becomes very much, how do I stop this? Because I can't do this, right? And so, um, you know, I think particularly pertinent to the food and ag sector in in this space, it's like when we talk about the risk and the climate risk, um, I feel like that too many companies feel like this is a 2030 or 2040 problem. And, you know, the, the, the risk is here today um, in the food and ag sector. And like, if you don't figure out what your risk is, if you don't put in place a mitigation plan, um, by the time that it hits, it'll be too late because your farmers are at risk today. Um, and if you don't figure out a way to help them when they go out of business, you go out of business. And so I feel like there's a lack of urgency um, amongst many companies to think, well, I just have to worry about the next quarter, you know, and the quarter after that. And and those, um, you know, profitability statements. And I can worry about 20, 30, 20, 40, you know, later. And by then it'll be too late. And so that's that's the part that that makes me a little bit outraged about all of this. Yeah, that is a that's a really great point, and that's something that I think is uh, foundational to this discussion. If you are not a policy or compliance minded person, but maybe a, a more profit minded person, is that if farmers go out of business as a land based as a company with a land based supply chain, farmers go out of business, we go out of business. Farmers go out of business. We have food access problems, um, commodity pricing problems, um, and so it's not it's not really about securing your business for the next quarter. It's about ensuring that you you have a business um, and ensuring that our access to food and the stability of our supply chains is covered. <laughs> Great. I have one more question for us to end on. Uh, and that is, what are you looking for throughout the rest of Q2 and the rest of 2024? Are there any other big milestones we should be keeping an eye out for? For me, I, I guess two things. Um, maybe they're related. Um, one is the election. Um, and the impacts of the the U.S. I mean, there are a lot, you know more than half the world's population is actually voting this year, and so um, you know the outcomes of all of those elections matter. Um, and in particular, um, here in the U.S., what does that mean for the Inflation Reduction Act and the implementation of that? So, like, are we going to continue um, to see that move ahead, or do we perhaps take a step back? Um, and then maybe more specific to the food and ag sector is really what's going to happen with the farm bill. I mean, I think everybody wants to know that, right? And so, like, how do we continue to um, to push this Congress that has so far been reluctant to do very much to at least do that? Yeah, um, definitely those two. I'm trying to think of fun regulatory things happening. <laughs> um, yeah, I think from like a, a reporting standpoint, there has been, um, so there's been talk in California of pushing back implementation of these bills or of, yeah, these bills. Um, so that's one specific regulatory thing. Um, but I can't, I'm with Jeff. I mean, you can't talk about what's going to happen when we have such a divided federal government and we have an election, a very important election year coming up that has the potential ability to, you know, either double down on the investments made through the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or strip that away. Um, and so to me, um, what happens in the election will then also have ramifications across the state, right? Oftentimes we'll see if the federal election, you know, goes one way, especially if it's Republican this year, that's going to embolden states like California, like New York, like Colorado, like your, you know, your classic progressive states to be making, not that Colorado is classically progressive, but it has become so, um, to start making, to start paving their own path, right? And really figuring out where within the 
jurisdiction that they have within their states, how do they make a go of this, right? So that's that's what I'm going to really be looking for is what's happening on the state level in potential response to um, how the federal election works works out. Thank you. Yeah, both great considerations and great things for us and our teams and our colleagues to keep an eye on throughout the rest of the year. Uh, I would like to thank you both for your time and for your expertise and insight. Uh, this was incredibly helpful uh, for me and I'm sure for others on the call as well. Uh, for those who are attending, you will receive a recording of this webinar afterwards, along with the takeaway documents I mentioned earlier and a quick survey. We'd love to know uh, what topics we can cover in the future. Otherwise, thank you all so much for being here. Appreciate your time and we'll see you at the next policy briefing. Yeah, thanks all. Um, and please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, find me on LinkedIn. I obviously love talking about this stuff. So if you guys have any additional follow-up questions, always happy to follow up. Likewise. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everybody.